Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining today's virtual seminar. I am Yogi Pangayu, your Master of Ceremony. This is our 49th virtual seminar since the pandemic. So today we are presenting Sovereign Wealth Fund Utility, Absorption and Allocation. This seminar is supported by Jasa Marga and media partner Majalah Stabilitas. We do appreciate you taking time off your busy schedule to join us today. We hope you will find the program we have lined up for you to be fruitful and engaging. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. For the audiences, um, for the audience in the Google Meet room, please kindly mute your microphone during the seminar. Please do not click the present now button and you can turn on captions if needed. And for all the audiences in both Google Meet and YouTube, if you have any question during the presentation, please type your question into the chat column. We'll bring them up for the Q&A session. Presentation and uh, presentation decks and e-certificate will be shared at the end of the seminar. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, before presentation from our prominent speakers, we would like to invite President Directors of LPPI, Mr. Mirza Aditya Suara, to deliver an opening remark. Mr. Aditya Suara, time is yours. Thank you, Pak Yogi. Uh, thank you, Pak Yogi. Uh, terima kasih. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, selamat siang, good afternoon. Uh, for everyone that uh, outside Indonesia. So uh, welcome again to uh, LPPI uh, webinar, uh, virtual seminar. So this is the 49 uh, virtual seminar uh, from LPPI. We started April last year uh, at the beginning of the, of the pandemic. So almost every week we have a virtual seminar to discuss and to communicate to the public about uh, regulations, about policy, about situations, and with the participants, the panelists is coming from the government, coming from the regulator, from the industry, uh, and also uh, from a financial sector and non-financial sectors. So, uh, so uh, today our topic is about sovereign wealth fund. So I believe this is not not the first time for LPPI to have a seminar about virtual, uh, about uh, sovereign wealth fund. Probably this is the second or the third time uh, uh, that we discuss in our uh, uh, seminar about sovereign wealth funds. So uh, thank you very much for Pak Rida. CEO of Indonesia uh, Sovereign Wealth Fund, Indonesia Investment Authority. Uh, thank you very much for Pa uh, Doni Arsal, uh, Finance and Risk uh, Director, Risk Management Director of Jasa Marga, uh, and also our uh, guest uh, speakers from uh, outside Indonesia, Mr. Nazim Faswas Al Kutz, uh, former CEO of uh, Invest ID Abu Dhabi. Mr. Michael Zibin, a CEO of Perfectum Capital. Uh, Mrs. Julia Sorhina, Deputy Director, uh, VEBRF. Uh, uh, and uh, so thank you for uh, uh, your willingness to participate in our uh, virtual seminar. And to our moderator, Ibu Ayu uh, Sari uh, Wulandari. So, uh, Mr. Nazim, uh, Mr. Michael, and Ibu uh, Mrs. Julia. So LPPI is a is a training center uh, that's uh, founded by our Bank Indonesia, so Indonesia Central Bank. So we have been uh, operating, uh, I think, already uh, sixty two years. Uh, uh, so so it's quite old already. So, uh, so for Indonesia, especially uh, people in the banking sector, financial sector, they, they know very well about LPPI. So again, thank you uh, for your time uh, uh, to, to join our uh, virtual seminar. So, uh, so we know that 
we are still in the middle of pandemic uh, but in terms of economic situations uh, we believe that uh, the, the financial market and also the pandemic situations uh, second quarter this year this is already june compared to june last year that the situation is uh, already significantly different june last year uh, second quarter last year indonesia had uh, gdp growth uh, was minus 5.2 percent while in the first quarter this year we are already the minus already becoming less and less uh, we had uh, gdp growth uh, first quarter was zero uh, minus 0.7 percent so from minus five to minus 0.7 and uh, for the second quarter this year uh, several economists uh, forecast that for this uh, second quarter uh, the number will be around uh, seven to eight uh, percent gdp growth for second quarter uh, yeah, year on year and the four year for indonesia uh, this year uh, uh, range from uh, 4.2 to 4.8 percent of uh, GDP growth. Uh, so uh, the discussions about uh, sovereign wealth fund is, uh, is this is a hot topic in Indonesia because it is a new is a new uh, thing for Indonesia. Uh, so the sovereign wealth funds is actually uh, is a product of uh, uh, deregulations is a product of uh, regulations. Uh, that just recently uh, released by by the parliaments, by the government and the parliaments. So the the soft, uh, so the sovereign wealth funds uh, is uh, is maybe is only around uh, three months, four months. So this is a still new things, but we have uh, high uh, expectations from Indonesia public about uh, the role of sovereign wealth fund in Indonesia how to attract funds coming to Indonesia and join together with the Indonesia Sovereign Wealth Funds uh, uh, to, to participate in the number of uh, projects uh, that are offered by, uh, uh, by, by the governments or by the, or by the state-owned companies uh, or even by the private sectors that the Sovereign Wealth Fund and the partners from uh, uh, foreign countries uh, uh, to to join the, the 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 projects. So I I uh, I hope that uh, Mr. Nazim, uh, Mr. Michael, and uh, Mrs. Julia can uh, give your perspective, your experience uh, outside Indonesia about uh, sovereign wealth fund uh, uh, activities. And Pak Doni, uh, terima kasih banyak for your uh, uh, participations. So we we hope that we can uh, uh, learn from you about uh, toll road projects and what is your, what you think about the prospect of toll road projects and what you think about uh, uh, the Indonesia Sovereign Wealth Funds. And of course, uh, thank you very much for Pak Rida again uh, for your time to. Uh, to participate in our uh, seminar. So thank you and enjoy the, the seminar. Great. Um, thank you very much, Pak Mirza Aditya Suara. Dear everyone, we can inform you that at the moment, um, 105 participants are joining in Google Meet. 225 are joining on YouTube streaming. So in total, in total we have 330 and of course there will be more audiences coming up so um ladies and gentlemen we are fortunate to have five prominent speakers today mr rida wirakusuma ceo of indonesia investment authority mr nazim fawaz al kutsi former ceo of invest ad and former chief investment officer the national bank of abu dhabi mr mikhail zibin CEO Perfectum Capital, Professor Julia Chuariko, Professor Julia Suarikina, Deputy Director of VEB, and Mr. Doni Arsal, Director of Finance and Risk Management, Jasa Marga. Now, without any further ado, we will turn the time over our um, we will turn the time over our esteemed moderator, Mrs. 
Ari, Mrs. Ayu Sari Wulandari, Senior Vice President Data Management and Analytics of Bank Negara Indonesia. Mrs. Ayu, time is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Mas Yogi. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, everybody. A very warm welcome to everybody. It's a very wonderful day, and I feel privileged to extend my warm welcome to all presented here in the 49th LPPI virtual seminar. My name is Ayusari Bulandari, and you can just call me Ayu. And I am Senior Vice President of Data Management and Analytics in Bank Negara Indonesia. For who the, the audience that might not be familiar with, Bank Negara Indonesia is one of the state-owned banks in Indonesia. And we are also currently running lots of international business and also facilitating global investment flow from and to Indonesia worldwide. So uh, for the next two and a half hour, I'm really delighted to be your host today and hopefully everybody will get the most benefit of it. Okay, uh, today's webinar is really hot topic worldwide, like Pak Mirza also said earlier. And especially for Indonesia, which is among those hot target for global investors. So according to Investopedia, I, a sovereign wealth fund defined as a state-owned pool of money that is invested in various financial assets. And the primary function of a sovereign wealth fund are firstly to stabilize the country's economy through diversification and secondly to generate wealth for future generation and over the last couple of decades the size and number of sovereign wealth fund have grown dramatically and according to uh, SWF institute which is one of the global corporation there were more than 90 sovereign wealth funds with the combined asset amounting to nearly eight 0.2 trillion US dollar in 2020. So it's a very huge money, right? So, but the remaining question is how the authority can optimize the asset allocation, whilst on the other hand, how the absorption can bolster market economy. So we hope that this webinar will provide audience with insightful knowledge and that answering also those questions. Okay, uh, for the next two hours, we will have five presentations from our speakers here. They will present their topics for about 15 minutes each. And the question and answer session will be held after the end of the presentations. So let me remind again, if you have any question during the presentation, please type them into the chat box and write down your name and also name of institution that you are currently presented. And then since we have five distinguished uh, speakers, so please also mention to whom your question are addressed. I'll bring them up at the end of the presentation session. You can ask both in English and also in Bahasa. Never mind. Okay. And again, to keep the quality of sound functional during the webinar, uh, please unmute yourself or allow me to add, uh, or allow me add, or the admin to mute you or the room if necessary. However, it will be appreciated if you could switch your camera on so we all could bring warmer ambience in this webinar with all those shining and smiling faces on board. Thank you. Okay, we have five distinguished speakers today and I will explain their credentials and expertise at the opening of each presentation session later on. So allow me to introduce them. Uh, our first speaker, our first speakers is Mr. Rida Wirakusuma, the CEO of Indonesia Investment Authority. Hello Pak Rida, are you there with us? Oh, I think he's in the, on the other conversation. Okay, he will join later. Okay, and also we have Mr. Doni Arta, Chief Financial Officer and also Risk Director of Jasa Marga. Hello, Pak Doni. Hello, Bu Ayu. How are you today, Pak? I'm fine, Bu. Okay. 
Okay, welcome thank and thank you for coming, Pak. And then we have our guests here. Uh, first, we have Mr. Nazim Fawaz Al Qudsi, former CEO of Invest AD, and also former Chief Investment Officer, National Bank of Abu Dhabi. Hello, Mr. Nazim. Hello and good afternoon to you. How are you, sir? How are you, sir? Fine, thank you. Okay, welcome. Thank, welcome. thank you for, thank joining, you for us. joining us. Pleasure. Okay, the next okay, speaker, the next speaker is, is Mr. Mikhail Zibin, the CEO of Perfectum Capital. Hello, Mr. Zibin. Hello, how are you? How are you? Good, thank you very much. Okay, welcome and thank you for participating in this webinar. And last but not least, uh, Dr. Julia Zorikina, Deputy Director of VEB Russia Federation. How do you do? How I'm you? fine. Okay. Uh, hello. I'm fine, thank you. Welcome. And thank you for giving us the opportunity to learn from you in this webinar. Okay, all speakers, all speakers will present for about 15 minutes and then allow me to interrupt and also remind you then you have to resume your presentation in three minutes afterwards. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think uh, uh, let's start with uh, good news to Indonesia New Sovereign Wealth Fund, Indonesia Investment Authority, INA, that the United Arab Emirates announced their commitment to invest 10 billion US dollars. So the authority also previously said that the INA had received commitments of up to 10 billion US dollars as well before it launched. So from the many global companies and also many agencies such as US International Development Finance Corporation, IDFC, uh, from Japan Bank of International Corporation, GBIC, and also some pension funds. That was a really good news, right? Uh, to get more detailed explanation and how the authorities will process the funding and how to allocate them, we already have here the most credible spokesperson to explain, Bapak Rida Juanda Wirabusuma. But unfortunately, unfortunately, now he has another uh, meeting and he will join us later on. So uh, let's start with our next speakers is Mr. Nazim Pawas Al Qudsi. So let me introduce him first. He is an entrepreneur with over 30 years of global investment in experience, uh, of course, in a sovereign wealth fund industry. And he also spent 18 years managing the US and Japanese public equities at the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority. So being the chief of investment officer at National Bank of Abu Dhabi, which is one of the largest in UD Arab Emirates, Mr. Nazim also the CEO of Invest ID, AD, and uh, it's a UAE regional sovereign wealth fund, where he created a global network across Middle East, US, Europe, China, Japan, Russia, and Africa. And as an invest, as an investment expert, Mr. Nazim also chairman of several influential boards in Middle East, including Airport International Group in Jordan, Abu Dhabi Financial Services Company, Eco Logistic in Turkey, and Emirates International Investment Company. And this is very interesting, Russia Winter Olympic Village Investment Project. Wow. You are really a world-class global investment guru, sir. <laughs> okay, Mr. Najim will share with uh, us his experience in financing the economy and also the key success factor for running the Sovereign Wealth Fund organization. This is very fruitful knowledge for everybody here. And we are really honored to have you here, Mr. Najim. So let me offer the time to you, sir. Mr. Najim. Mr. Najim. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Madam Operator, uh, uh, Moderator. I appreciate it. Uh, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, very happy to be here among you today, uh, distinguished uh, group. Uh, I speak as a private citizen, so perhaps my comments would be more relaxed about a very uh, interesting and hot topic. Uh, you, you mentioned in your opening remarks the word guru, which I found very interesting because I need to pay homage to my guru Adia, the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority, 
where I started my career and I spent 18 years. Uh, this has left a huge impact on me. And I want to start with Adia to say that a sovereign wealth fund ultimately is the pride of a nation. The sovereign wealth fund is the child that is born uh, to take and help the family affairs in the long term. How we raise that child, how we approach that child is going to be extremely important. Let me explain. Uh, in any economy, uh, there is a private sector and there is a public sector. They are short-term interests, they are intermediate interests. The first thing I would say, if we talk generally, there must be an agreement between the executive branch and the legislative branch on the mission and support of the sovereign wealth fund. Obviously, with the proper, proper oversights, both from the executive and from the legislative. But a sovereign wealth fund should not be an area where differences uh, are utilized for political uh, gains. I say this and I emphasize this because today, if you look at some of the sovereign wealth funds around the world, and I can speak from knowledge of ADIA, some of our most respected top finance executives in Abu Dhabi and the Emirates are graduates of ADIA, are graduates of this school. A sovereign wealth fund backed by a nation typically is going to have access to some of the best and brightest institutions globally, managing different asset classes. By default, they want to come and seek your business uh, as, you, you, as, as you have those investment opportunities. So you're going to have the chance to interact with those uh, uh, individuals. And hence, I go back to raising that child. In essence, if I can bring tennis, I remember when I started learning how to play tennis, sometimes you learn uh, 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 wrong moves that can still carry you in the game. But then the coach or the instructor will try to correct those moves because they want you to start properly, even though you think. Managing funds, financing an economy and attracting funds all starts with the state of mind of the, of the collective group of people who are entrusted with that. Often we have very short term goals that dominate the agenda. Often there are conflict of interests everywhere in the world. The issue here is, while we might get quite a bit of gains in the short term, we might building not on proper foundations as we expand uh, uh, forward. Now, in my capacity, uh, after leaving ADIA, uh, I was exposed to the banking sector. The National Bank of Abu Dhabi at that time was the largest bank uh, in the country. And then Invest AD, which was a regional uh, sovereign fund uh, entrusted with some of the assets. And like any semi-government institutions, we had our share issue of legacy assets. Legacy assets often uh, that balance sheets are saddled with. Now, please appreciate that the environment we've been living over the past 20, 30 years has been that of significant central bank money printing uh, led by the US Federal Reserve. And that liquidity, the bulk of it has been finding its place to the financial assets, the fin publicly traded or semi publicly traded financial assets. And because of that, we continue to have the mini bubbles. The issue here, and the reason I bring this up, is because think of a high tide. And what does the high tide hide in terms of inefficiencies uh, in the economy? I'll come a bit later to a very different environment that I think we are embarking on. But to go back, 
when we looked at our regional sovereign wealth fund, we saw that there was liquidity, UAE being a, 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 a carbon hydrate rich uh, country with uh, excess cash flow, but obviously the economy is growing and so has the responsibilities. We did not have an issue with liquidity. The issue we had is, are we utilizing the funds in the most efficient way? Then the question came, you have a child and is that child too protected? And by being too protected, is that child having an issues competing on the international arena? So if I am about to go embarking on attracting funds from the outside, is that child able to brush shoulders with some of the very bright and interesting minds out there? Or are we in this protective environment where the child is always given what he or she wants and therefore uh, the, the expectations are set in that? We decided to embark on an international global partnerships, meaning that instead of coming to some of our entities and just simply funding them and having the proper people for oversight. And the problem with that is, you know, we are all uh, one happy big family and family members can only go so far. <laughs> there are too many considerations. You need the outsiders who don't have the blood connections, who don't have, you know, the, 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 the difficulties in expressing opinion, opinions. When we started embarking on this, clearly in many situations, we had uh, cultural issues because especially uh, whether it's American or some of the uh, Anglo-Saxon uh, European uh, quarters where people are more uh, forthcoming in their comments, more competitive, you could say sometimes uh, they're a bit more short-term oriented in terms of results. But what came to the picture is that in order for some of our entities to become more competitive, I must expose them to outside forces. I, I must expose them to people that have a stake in the game, to institutions who are going to contribute, uh, whether in kind or uh, financially and so on. You know, some, um, some of the spots in the world, uh, you find great science. They have great scientists. But then you come and ask yourself, are they able to commercialize that science? And you find out that no, there's, there's, there's a missing link. Uh, great science that far supersedes other parts of the world, but they're not able to uh, commercialize. So going back to the, you are just starting a sovereign wealth fund many congratulations that's something to be proud of that's 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 a birth of 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 a significant child in that wonderful family called indonesia uh, how you enable that child to help steer the economy in the long term because you you, you have tremendous resources indonesia one of the uh, very blessed countries in terms of the human resource, the people, the wonderful people, and then the resources. Uh, you're going to have a lot of uh, conflict of interests. And I speak again as a private citizen from over 30 years of experience. Uh, how you maneuver uh, those corridors is going to be interesting. Uh, discipline, uh, process, uh, proper valuation models, uh, governance. Now I appreciate that different parts of the world are at different uh, spots on that curve. And I'm not for a second uh, ignorant of the fact that some of the more developed financial markets have their own massive issues. Uh, but going back to the issue of how do we help finance and steer funds to our institutions from local coffers 
and from international funds. I think the cadre of alumni that will be coming, some of them uh, alumni have entered the Sovereign Wealth Fund of Indonesia, and some of them will be more fresh. But that cadre of, of human resource that will be helping steer the economy indirectly towards long-term sustainable goals uh, will be extremely important. And unless there is an agreement, as I said, between the different stakeholders that this is what we want to do, this is how we're going to do it, and we're all going to be very supportive, uh, uh, there will be issues. Um, I would I would maybe finally just uh, talk about some of our uh, uh, partnerships. Uh, one specific project where we uh, were the major investor in building the new airport in Amman, Jordan, which was a PPP. Uh, there's some very, very interesting different stakeholders from the Gulf, uh, from Europe, from the States, and uh, the majority of my time was spent on trying to bring the different stakeholders uh, to a proper agreement on how to do things. Because what I have found out that we can all go to some of the best business schools and finance schools, but cultural issues and beyond cultural issues, uh, archetype issues. You know, there's a big field uh, of, of uh, uh, psychology investing out there that at the end of the day, we wake up, we're all humans, we have families, uh, we have good moments and we have arguments in the house and we go and whether we're trading public equities or attending uh, meetings, uh, part of those emotions we bring with us. And therefore, uh, we're not simply uh, on a machine learning uh, curve. The environment I talked about earlier uh, that is changing. I personally see a deglobalization environment starting. We might have different players around the world. I only th think they happen to come. Uh, nations are going to want to contain more of their natural and financial resources within borders. I think the epidemic uh, that we are currently experiencing has highlighted the fact that many, while concentrating on segments of the economy have ignored other segments. And uh, therefore, I see a significant move towards hard infrastructure. I think the current administration in the US is gonna lead the world in that. I see a significant uh, package ultimately being approved, whereby, uh, you know, simply taking a ride from uh, JFK to Manhattan you can count how many potholes your taxi hits. Uh, so therefore, I think you too in Indonesia is going to have, you're going to have a wonderful uh, supporting global environment to concentrate on your, on the different layers of the infrastructure, because I simply don't see the majority of the liquidity that is created by the central bank only going to financial markets. And by default, the financial assets are going to be looked at much more carefully by investors because that high tide will perhaps start getting low. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, you Mr. Nazim. This is a very, a very uh, uh, interesting key thing I take I from take your, from statement, your statement, statement, Mr. Nasir. Mr. Nasir. You, you, are, you are, uh, figuring are figuring the, the sovereign, sovereign wealth funds, funds figuring, figuring like, like a like rice, a rice cow. Cow. yeah. And this is newborn sovereign wealth fund in Indonesia is like a newborn child. And this is, will be uh, depend on us how to nurture them, right? And then whether they will grow, uh, sustainably to financing the growth economy. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Panazin. Okay, uh, let's start with our uh, second uh, speakers. Uh, like I told you before that the 
the IMA has already received commitments for more than 10 billion US dollar from many agencies, a big company. So to get more detailed explanation on how the authority will process the funding and how to allocate them, we already have here the most credible spokesperson to explain, Bapak Rida Juanda Wirakusuma, which is the CEO of Indonesia Investment Authority. Uh, let me explain you the credential of uh, Bapak Rida. He has long-term experience in the area of investment, insurance, and also banking. His previous position was the president director of Bank Permata from uh, 2017 to April 2021. And beforehand, he was the president and also CEO of AIG, Consumer Finance Group Asia, and also president of and CEO of Asia Pacific region of American International Group Incorporated, and many more precious positions at the executive level, uh, namely Bank of Trust Indonesia, General Electric, GE Money Asia, which is one of the subsidiaries of GE, City Group Finance Indonesia, and also have great experience in Thailand and Hong Kong. He got his MBA from Ohio University and the doctorate degree at City University of Hong Kong. Farida, how are you today, Pak? I'm good, thank you very much. Okay, Pak Farida, without further ado, I will turn the time over to you, Farida. Thank you. Um, Good afternoon, um, everyone. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity for me to speak uh, and present um, INA. Um, yes, indeed, Mr. Nazim, this is a child born about 75 days ago, to be exact. So it's an extremely young child. And hopefully, I already feel loved because there are so many things about INA written in so many publications. Most of them are extremely encouraging. Some of them are more true than others. I hope um, with the short presentations I'll be presenting uh, in, in the next few um, minutes, I will be able to perhaps uh, explain a little bit more about uh, who Ina is, what Ina is trying to do. Um, I'm going to try to attempt to share my screen. I had had some difficulties before, so hopefully um, I'll be able to do uh, um, uh, take this forward if, I, if you don't mind. Um, it's always been an extremely um, frustrating uh, experience if I if I because um, I usually use Zoom, so I'm actually a little bit not so familiar with the. Uh, with Google Meet, so please, please give me um, uh, just one more minute to, to try to um, to make this work. That's all right, Parida. Just take your time. Okay, let me try again. Oh, I just saw, and then it's disappeared. Hang on. Let me just call somebody um, who actually I think is more expert than me in in this uh, sharing. Yeah, hang on, hang on a second, please. Sorry about this. So, everybody, while we are waiting, Parida, uh, we already have uh, many questions in the chat box. Just okay. and it's still coming. You are all welcome for the question in the chat box. Okay, Parida, you have 15 minutes, Parida. Are you okay now? Yeah, I am just trying to load my PowerPoint. Just, just give me a second, okay? Can you find the present button at the bottom? Mm -hmm. Present button. It, uh, yeah, it's the uh, fifth button yeah. from the and left. Yes, yes, that's right. Window, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, so I got that. It's just that my PowerPoint doesn't seem to appear again for some reason. Um, I mean, I can talk to you about this rather than just presenting it, but it's been frustrating because I've had this technical oh. issues since, okay. since early this morning. Um, I am going to try to attempt one more time and then I'll, otherwise I will talk. Okay. Just, uh, or maybe you can just uh, WhatsApp or email it to the admin and the admin will show it for you, Pak Rida. Mm -hmm. uh, Pak Yogi, uh, this help, Pak Rida, just maybe. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, show them. Our slide. We will be happy to present from our side. It looks like what it says is I supposed to close it and then redial back in again. Do you mind giving me one minute to do that? Of course, that's fine. Okay. And then in the meantime, I'll send it over to you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, while we are waiting uh, uh, Pak Rida presentation, let me just uh, address one question that come up from uh, Fajri Salimi, the manager of risk management at Waskita Toll Road. And his question is addressed to Mr. Nazim. This is the question for you. Uh, I would like to ask question to Mr. Nazim. Would you explain your experience in the financing infrastructures and what are the obstacles and problems in financing that such activities? And what are the obvious differences between sovereign wealth fund and other resources of fund, especially in supporting financing structure? Mr. Nazim, time is yours. Yes, uh, thank you for the question. So uh, first I would say, uh, uh, a, a clear uh, a legislation is going to be very, very important. Uh, sets the agenda for such uh, partnerships. Second, I would say uh, access to the proper uh, government uh, corridors. And that's when I said uh, that we need to, you know, there are always differences in a family. I have, in my family, we have differences and so on. But when you're inviting those type of uh, outside relationships, you have to be able to be reading from the same script. Some of uh, the most challenges we've had in different uh, locales uh, globally is when the right hand is not necessarily synced with the left hand or the left hand feels a bit uh, not happy being left out by the right hand. And I'm sure uh, you, 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 you appreciate uh, where this is uh, coming from. The uh, in investors ultimately uh, are looking for returns. If they're investing in infrastructure, then they should be very comfortable with the very long-term uh, profile of that asset class. Having said that, they need quite a bit of visibility because in order to have faith in long-term uh, cash flow, you know, cash flow is my is my Bible, is my. Uh, holy book, so to speak, because I think everything else is much easily manipulated. Um, in order to have faith in the cash flows, you need to have visibility and you need to have uh, some form of, of stability. So uh, I would say that the stakeholders from the government side, uh, I often found when they are career officers, and not simply a high turnover political appointees, it really makes life easier. You're always gonna have political appointees. I respect that and I will bow to them and then offer them the due respect, but you need that layer underneath that is stable, that knows what is going on and, and, and is entrusted. Often when you have a high turnover in that second layer, uh, it creates a lot of issues. I hope my general comments are not too general. Thank you, Mr. Najib. Thank you, Mr. Najib. Thanks. Okay. Uh, let me back to uh, Mas Yogi. Is it okay? The party the presentation? Is it ready yet? Um, I, I just well, said... We need one. Yes. Yeah. All right. 
We already Juga. received it, Pak Rida. Uh, we need a um, couple seconds to try to present it. Uh, just bear with us in seconds. Okay. okay. Thank you, Pak Ayu. Fantastic. And, and while we're waiting uh, Pak Yogi to prepare, Pak Rida, maybe you will have something just to uh, uh, give a brief uh, explanation maybe for your project now to the audience. Time to you, Pak Rida. Yeah. Pak Rida. Um, um, and again, first and foremost, you know, my, my biggest apology, I'm not used with uh, with this uh, different different technology. The, 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 the irony is, as you will see later on, digital transformation is actually one of the areas that INA is actually looking into. But the an array of Google Meet and, and uh, WebEx meetings and Zoom and then Microsoft Teams, you know, sometimes it's different things. So biggest apology for that. But INA, um, I, 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 I heard uh, Mr. Nazim's um, uh, uh, presentation uh, extremely attentive, uh, uh, attentively because obviously, if you look into the experience in UAE, Adia has an extremely long history of over 45 years. It was established in 1976, or Mubadala, for example, which was only established in 2007, but the precursor uh, IPC was actually established in 1984. Tamasek and GIC was established 50 years ago. Even the new country called East Timor, which was uh, when to become um, independent in 2002, just three years later in 2005, they already have a sovereign wealth fund. So for an Indonesian uh, as, an, as, a, as a country, which has over 75 years of history, to only now begin a sovereign wealth fund some argue that it is uh, late, but it's better late than never. Um, and as, as, as we all say, we want to make sure that it is done uh, properly and we want to make sure that it is actually done in the best governed, most transparent and the best way possible to make sure that whatever we handle will pass the test of politics, the test of time, the test of business cycle, so that we could actually create wealth for generations to come way long after I leave my position. Uh, but it should be, you know, again, be something for for our children and grandchildren to enjoy in the times ahead. So it's extremely important that whatever we do at INA um, is done the most appropriate way and the best way possible from all sort of standards. I'm not sure if you have the presentations already, Ibu Ayu, but uh, I, I have shared that that uh, with yeah. the, the team. So you know, you guys, you know, please go ahead and and start Let, if you. Yeah. Let me check, uh, Ayogi. Can you just yes. present it now? Um, in the middle of presenting, uh, Bu Ayu, I'm afraid um, we we need to a uh, little bit modify modify the presentation since it was PDF. So yeah, okay. bear with us in a couple of seconds. Maybe Pak Rida um, can I, help us to continue a little bit uh, explaining about or preaching about the materials. Okay. Well, the um, the um, uh, I have a number of things I can share with you. Uh, let me begin with the vision of Ina. INA or INA or Indonesian Investment Authority or some people say Lembaga Pengelola Investasi or people say Sovereign Wealth Fund is one of the same. INA, INA um, is an abbreviation that actually is expressed by Pak Jokowi specifically. He wants the uh, acronyms to be INA because INA is a well-known acronym for Indonesia in the international cycle, circle. So Indonesian Investment Authority uh, has a vision, number one, to help attain Indonesia's sustainable development and also to build wealth for the country's future generations. Okay, Parida, I think your presentation is coming, Pak. It's already there, Pak. Can you see it? Yeah, let's, um, uh, let's go to the next one, please. Um, and please ignore the IDX uh, name at the bottom. I hope you don't mind. I actually just gave the presentations earlier to IDX as well. It's actually a very similar presentation. So please, you know, I sent the wrong one. There, there is a specific one for LPPE, but I hope you don't mind. Let's go to the next one, please. 
Um, and I'll go very fast. I think I, I went through this, you know, we want to help attain Indonesia's sustainable development and also build wealth for future country, a country's future generations. I think I mentioned this. Uh, next, please. Um, we have a number of missions. I don't want to go through in detail, but we are actually a commercial being. Um, INA, one of the mission is to invest the right assets and can deliver back the optimal risk adjusted returns for INA or for anybody who are co-investing with us. We also want to collaborate with investors that are credible. I think our first platform, tall platform, we have um, four members in the tall, tall platform. Among them is Adia, um, who's also investing alongside with us. Um, also a pension farm from a pension fund from Canada and then a pension fund from uh, uh, Netherlands. So CDPQ and APG and Adia invest alongside with us, a tall platform um, that I can I will explain a little bit later. We want to be able to uh, create values of our investments through uh, best practice executions. I think Mr. Nazim talked about, you know, the people that are Adia, you know, you know um, graduated to become the leaders in UAE. They have to know what's happening and what's going on. They have to have the best expertise. Uh, they have to be able to understand the risk and reward of any investments that you're making to make sure that the investment that the Adia is making or Mubadal is making actually giving them the returns that they want. Um, we also want, just like any other sovereign wealth fund, advanced Indonesian competitiveness. And of course, all these should be made possible if we have the best world-class human resources and best talents. Next, please. Um, INA values, you know, entrench in the way we do things based on integrity responsibility, innovation, collaborations, and excellence is something that we actually keep reminding our, our young team to make sure that we don't violate any of this. Next, please. Next. Um, in terms of just a brief description of INA governance, we have two boards. One is supervisory board, um, which is the Minister of Finance um, as the chairperson, Ibu Sri Mulyani, the Minister of State on Entity, uh, Pa Eric Tohir, three independent professionals and five professionals on the director level. Um, I am the head of the director's level. These two boards reports directly to the president uh, of Indonesia. Um, so this is how the uh, brief description of INA governance and we're supposed to run the funds and the platforms. I'll, I'll tell you uh, a little bit about that as well. Next, please. Um, let me just run through who's who on the uh, professional uh, supervisory board. Uh, Dr. Haryanto Sahari is a CPA and also a chartered accountant. He is a senior partner of Private Waterhouse Cooper or PWC. He has a number of expertise in governance and risk management. He sits as a commissioner at Bank Permata, Unilever, audit committee member in Unilever, um, and, and there's a number of other things that he is part of. Uh, Dr. Yasuo Marcus um, is a well-known uh, law lawyer. He has his own um, uh, law firm. He's been involved in a number of, um, of uh, high-profile capital market um, activities. Also one of the leading businessmen in hospitality uh, areas. Dr. Darwin Cyril Nurhadi is also one of the most prominent investors in Indonesia. He sits on a number of uh, leading uh, com Indonesian companies as a board member. Next, please. I myself, I joined INA, same with other directors on the 16th of February. I am also accompanied by Mr. Arif Budiman, um, who is my deputy chief executive officer. He's also a CIO. He was a CEO of Danarexa. He was a CFO of Pertamina. He was the CEO of McKinsey Indonesia. He was graduated from Wharton um, and ITB, which is one of the best well-known um, Indonesia school. Um, so he was actually also the chairperson of the INA creation. So he knows a lot about INA, maybe more so than I do actually. Next, please. We have Stefanos, who's the other CIO. He also graduated from Wharton. He had a number of um, experience, including the managing director of one of the leading private equities in Southeast Asia. 
Um, he was with IBM. And then Marita Ali Shahbana, the Chief Risk Officer with over 30 years of experience in risk management, not only in Indonesia, but also in Southeast Asia. Next, please. Um, Eddie is, um, has a number of experience. He was a CFO of Garuda, among others, a CFO of Delta Dunia. He was part of North Star Group. Um, he has an MBA in finance and banking from, you know, University of Illinois in the U.S. Next, please. Let me tell you a little bit about the legal status. INA is, you know, legal term is a sui generis, um, established under the law and government regulations. One is on the law number 11 on job creation, um, also backed by the government regulation atau peraturan pemerintah number 74. Um, it is clearly stated that we're supposed to be able to help sustain Indonesian development, attract capitals, primarily a commercial entity and hopefully play an active role in improving Indonesia investment climate. And I also will talk a little bit about that. So next, please. Um, INA, as you would appreciate, has a number of unique features. It has a full authority in making investment decision, make, you know, managing its own profit and loss, the flexibility and ability to adapt international investing best practices, we do have preferential rights. We have privileges in terms of understanding and going into the deals uh, within the BUMN or SOEs that may or may not be available beforehand. We do have bankruptcy protections. Um, so there are a number of INA unique features that may actually be desirable by the co-investors. Co Next, please. Um, INA is the right partner for uh, not only global investors, also domestic investors. Uh, the unique strength, uh, the professional management, the government support, a solid legal status, as I explained, and also the ESG minded in terms of the basis in our investing approach. Um, we also put a lot of attention to make sure that what we invest has a number of positive impact to the societies and to the co-investors alike. Next, please. Um, I don't think I need to go through the investment philosophy. Um, all the investments are aimed to get optimal risk adjusted returns. Uh, we will invest in sectors with large growth opportunity, which is uniquely uh, part of Indonesian uh, government development. Uh, we also have ability to invest not only in public sector or state owned, we can invest in private sectors. In fact, our mandate can also be investing outside Indonesia if we want to, as long as it helps Indonesia competitiveness. Uh, next. Um, a lot of people ask about what are the options for investment structures if anybody wants to invest in INA. This chart was actually developed prior to the creation of INA where the anchor investors will come through either through the master fund or come to what I call a thematic fund, a thematic fund in in the funds that are focusing on digital infrastructure, on healthcare or renewables or infrastructures like toll roads or airport or seaports. Um, but the a slight variations of this chart, next please, is that um, we uh, investor now um, can go directly into the infrastructure, like in the case of toll roads or going through the master fund and the master fund go down to the thematic funds. Next, please. Um, this is probably the most asked and the most attractive from a number of people who wants to understand where has been our focus. First and foremost, let me just tell you a little bit about why investing in Indonesia infrastructure. The medium to long-term plan of the government stated that we will need at least 460 billion or half a trillion US dollar to sustain the development in Indonesia, specifically on infrastructure. However, Indonesia fiscal and budget, the APBN, can only provide around less than half of that money. Meaning there is a, a lot of money needs to be collected. Uh, this is not counting if there is something called the new capital city. This is just the, the infrastructure development that we have. So as you would appreciate, infrastructure has attractive uh, multiplier effect and also stable 
effective returns. Um, and so what we are trying to think about is to make sure that whomever wants to come in can participate in the development and the improvements of Indonesia infrastructure. This is just infrastructure. I'll talk a little bit more uh, later about a number of other areas. Next, please. Um, for INA, we can go into any type of industry if you want to. I listed the initial nine, but today we are focusing on four. One is infrastructure that includes airports, seaports, toll roads. We are focusing on digital transformation that actually has been expanded, starting from digital infrastructure, but also digital services and digital platform. I'll talk a little bit about that. We also have a life deal on healthcare and a life deal on renewable energies. Those are the four things we're focusing on. So we have life deals today on infrastructure, on digital, on healthcare, and on renewable energies. Not to say that we're not focusing on other areas, but these are the initial four. Next, please. Um, as you know, we closed the MOU uh, last month on toll road. Now, I don't know if you guys know this, but in the first 70 years of Indonesian development, 70, 70 years, we have 800 kilometers toll road. When President Jokowi came into power, he said 800 kilometers over 70 years, that's way too short for a country with such lofty potentials and unbelievable uh, future. So he then tasked the state-owned entities to say, why don't you guys start building more toll roads? So in the last five years, Indonesia built 1,100 kilometer. Hello. Um, uh, Yogi, I think someone uh, interrupting the presentation. Could you just please put it back to Parida presentation slide, Mas Yogi? Yeah, I think sure, Ibu Ayu, sure. Ibu Suartini is presenting it now. <laughs> Mbak Tini, tolong dimatiin dong sharingnya, boleh nggak? Oke. Oke. Oke, apologize for that. No, no worries. It so happened that I know Ibu, so I just want to say hello. <laughs> uh, next, next, next one, please. So here's the thing. I don't know if I, maybe I have lost you. Let me just repeat. The first 70 years, Indonesia has 800 kilometers. The last five years, we built 1,100. So, you know, now we have about 2,000, right? But when we built the last 1,100, it was actually funded mostly through debt. So, of course, a lot of the companies are pretty much full with a lot of debt. Now, when we set up these funds, and the setup of fund is, you know, 54 trillion or 3.75 billion, so we hope we will be able to then buy some of these toll roads from owners like Astra or Kutama Karya or Waskita Karya or Jasa Marga. So then they in turn can either pay their debt, you know, make their company more efficient or maybe even build the new toll roads. But at least we are providing alternative funding so that ourselves and CDPQ and ADIA and APG can benefit and participate in the um, in the toll road development as well. The goal is for our platform to then develop the O&M companies that will own and manage these toll roads. Um, and, and hopefully that will make the development of toll roads in Indonesia becomes better. And of course it has a huge amount of uh, multiplier effect. Next please. Um, this is just an announcement um, that uh, we did this uh, last month. Next, please. <clears throat> and we had a press release, so you can also visit our website and to, to, to read this. Next, please. Well, let me talk a little bit about digital. <clears throat> I mentioned that it's not just digital infrastructure. Um, there is also digital services. There's also digital platform. Within the digital infrastructures, we understand that the telco tower, or data center or fiber optics or broadband services are key to the development of digital. Now, I'm not talking just data centers um, as per data centers, but I'm talking about the high end, you know, um, <clears throat> hyper drive or edge uh, data centers that are now being developed. And we want to invest in that areas too. We have one life deal today on the digital infrastructure. 
We also are looking into the adjacency of digital infrastructure, um, whether it is digital services or digital platform, potentially even investing in some of the unicorns that are proven of the business models, but will also need digital services and digital infrastructure, because as we can learn from China, for example, um, China quantum leap in terms of development by utilizing technology and digital. Next, please. Pak Rida, allow me that to remind you that you have three minutes to resume your I can shut off if yeah. you want me Thank to you. tell me and I'll stop. Um, the um, I'm talking here about container terminals, huge opportunity in Indonesia if you combine all the ports are already number nine in terms of volumes, but we are one of the lowest in terms of containerizations in the world. So the, uh, the prospect is huge, we're just not there yet. Next, in the airport side, it's the same thing, or the cargo side. So at 65 million passengers, we are actually as big as Singapore and Hong Kong, but we're not running it the way it should be, even though we have the growth, which is fastest in the region. Same thing with cargo. I'm very sad to say that I was just in Soekarno Hatta airport a couple of weeks ago, and I was looking at the airport and the cargo. We are we have one of the fastest growing and biggest in volumes, but we are still manual. People are still moving cargoes by hand, which is actually rather embarrassing. But of course, for me and for the would be investors, is something extremely, extremely exciting if they can actually come in and invest alongside with us. Next, please. Um, the same thing with healthcare. Healthcare is also unbelievable. We have one of the lowest healthcare expenditure, one of the lowest beds for populations, while it was one of the fastest growth in the nations. Next, please. As I said to you, I can shut up as, as as quickly as you want me to. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Parida. It's very interesting uh, presentation, Parida. So I just got the four key in the key takeaways from your presentation that you will focusing on four sector, which is infrastructure, including airport, seaport, and also of course toll road, and also digital. Yes, agree, pa, digital is coming and so it's very nice and very excited to hear that you will invest also in the digital sector and also health this is really uh, very relevant with the pandemic situation and also renewable energy okay thank you parida and hope that you will stay with us and because you will uh, there's a lot of questions that coming up at the end of presentation Okay, uh, let me uh, go through the third speakers. And our third speaker is Mr. Mikhail Zibin. He is the co-founder of Tilo App, one of the technology company that created digital tools for farming industry. He started his career in third Russia, biggest integrated agricultural holding company. And the company was valued at uh, 1.5 billion US dollar by Golden Sack in 2008, and he's starting his career from economist to supervisory board uh, for economic and finance, and he has 20 years experiences and held senior financial position of corporate finance, investment, asset management, debt restructuring, and also merchant and acquisition, and he has uh, joining many company in Europe. United Arab Emirates, and lastly, the Russia Federation. And for the last uh, ten, 10 years, he has specialized in agro-technology, digital innovation, and also he is an agro-technology uh, startup enthusiast, and he holds MBA from Aston Business School, UK. So Indonesia is an agricultural country, but yet we have not reached our maximum potential of agroeconomy. So it is an honor to have you here, Mr. Zibin, and I hope that all the audience will get insightful knowledge from your agro-technology experience and how to optimize outcome through digitalization in farming industry. So he will share with us about uh, lesson learned investing in agro sector and also how to manage and control it. So without further ado, I will pass the time over to you, pa, uh, Mr. Zibin. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ayu. Uh, it is a pleasure. Uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you to LPPI uh, to invite me, and uh, this is an honor uh, to speak to such prominent uh, audience. And uh, I would like to make a short presentation uh, regarding 
just a second. So, uh, can you see it? Hello? We can see it. Yes, we can see it clearly, yes. uh, Mr. Zivet. Yes. Uh, great, just a second because <laughs> I can't see it right now. So. Um, <clears throat> actually, I would like to uh, say uh, that uh, all investors are looking for uh, risk and uh, return, uh, first of all, to balance this uh, too. And um, actually based on uh, different tools which used on, uh, I will make some comparables uh, with uh, uh, stock market tools which are uh, used by traders. And uh, there is a three types. Uh, one type is white box. Uh, so uh, we know uh, what we put inside. We know how it's processed, how information processed, and what uh, output uh, will be. Uh, with some adoptions, uh, and um, but we have a full knowledge regarding how it's calculated and what models are used. And uh, black box. So we have practically the same inputs. Uh, there is some uh, calculation inside. Nobody knows except uh, developers uh, how it's done and uh, we have zero knowledge uh, how it's prepared and we've got some output and actually there is a gray box uh, in the middle so we have some knowledge uh, how it's processed and uh, all traders uh, view advised to avoid uh, black box and uh, I have some experience uh, on due diligence of different agricultural companies and uh, also uh, due diligence uh, some uh, big holdings company uh, which uh, related to agriculture or agricultural ecosystem. And uh, unfortunately, I could say that um, farmer accounting and uh, financial reporting system uh, can have a, a gray box or black box features. So first of all, um, it could be staff errors. Uh, then uh, there is a long cycle. So uh, we have a, a big time gap between reports and uh, also creative accounting. So it depends on uh, how creative uh, company uh, it, uh, and inside of the reporting system, as uh, Mr. Nazim uh, said that cash flow this is a Bible and uh, other one uh, could be adopted uh, and in agriculture it's easy to adopt everything and uh, manipulate these figures and this is a problem and uh, no benchmarking practically uh, quite difficult to get uh, any benchmark uh, from different to different companies in agriculture because um, they have different features and uh, different report different uh, data collection and that why uh, very difficult even banks even financial institutes to analyze and make a precise benchmark uh, to any companies uh, in agri sector because variables it's uh, tons of variables which could link uh, to uh, different um, figures and also a lack of planning system uh, in a regional level. So it's uh, create some shortfalls or overproduction, which also uh, create the problem to agriculture and so on so far. And um, zero visibility on farmer levels uh, leads to unacceptable risk to banks and investors. Uh, for example, we discuss with uh, one bank in Uganda, uh, which uh, hold uh, pilot uh, to financing um, uh, farmer farms, and uh, they lost uh, almost 50% of funds employed. And so, uh, how to transform uh, black box into white box? Before uh, the answer, uh, before I answer on these questions, I try to answer these questions because it's uh, not. Uh, 
play a solution. Uh, and uh, we show we would like to uh, get where we are now. What does mean big data to many farms? Uh, I'm actually not joking, and uh, most farmers all over the world, because uh, our project um, work and operate in different uh, countries, and uh, our field teams have uh, thousands of hours uh, for interviews uh, on different uh, type of farms, uh, small uh, whole farmers, uh, big farms, uh, enterprises, uh, and so on. And everyone uh, struggle from um, a uh, huge number of uh, paperwork. And uh, all investor knows that uh, some uh, not structured, not reliable information uh, create more worse than absence of information. And uh, when we uh, make some investments uh, in pre previous uh, my uh, job experience, uh, we uh, found huge number of uh, misinterpretation uh, of uh, mistakes and so on. And um, all these uh, figures uh, takes uh, from a paper and uh, no matter which finally uh, reporting system they have, uh, ERP system or uh, other sophisticated and advanced uh, technological system, uh, initially it's created from a notebook. Uh, some people just make some notes on notebooks, then it's uh, put uh, to uh, some uh, sp uh, spreadsheet on paper, and then it's transformed to a uh, digital uh, accounting system. And uh, this flow uh, create a mistake practically on uh, each transition between uh, on this uh, data chain. So um, it's not very pretty, not uh, a, a secret that agriculture right now uh, just in the beginning of the journey of uh, level of di digitalization, and uh, we are here right now agriculture, and compare with other industry which uh, far uh, beyond uh, from agriculture, and. When talking about uh, sustainable innovation, uh, we have to um, keep in mind uh, that uh, performance that customer uh, can utilize, it's lower uh, than uh, sustainable innovation uh, which already uh, exists. So uh, later I will talk about agriculture 4.0 and agriculture 5.0. And uh, there is a huge gap uh, between what already exists and what could be employed and uh, the level of uh, absorption of uh, farmers. So um, we just in the uh, beginning of journey uh, for digitalization of uh, agriculture and uh, due to the uh, conservatism of uh, industry uh, we believe that uh, technological progress uh, have to be simple and adoptable in order not to uh, crush uh, um, uh, crash to industry uh, because uh, a lot of farmers uh, historically um, not ready uh, to uh, fast uh, developments. And uh, so I, I will turn to uh, these questions uh, to transform uh, black box into the white box. And um, first of all, uh, I would like to discuss about obstacles uh, which exist in uh, agriculture. So uh, first of all, um, uh, some technological obstacles, switching cost and uh, usability uh, and simplicity of the tool which uh, provided to farmers. So uh, as I said, uh, agriculture 4.0 is already exist. Uh, technologies exist. Uh, not it, It's not used uh, everywhere, but uh, some huge uh, uh, farmers are used uh, this technology. And uh, but the uh, 
agriculture uh, five zero uh, right now in the testing, and uh, the difference is uh, that uh, four zero it's uh, mainly uh, uh, IOT um, drones sensors etc etc and uh, um, processing and uh, data analytics uh, which uh, aggregated together and uh, predict uh, and um, uh, help to uh, farmers uh, to take uh, right decision. Agriculture 5.0, um, it's more artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning. And uh, all uh, result which created by uh, Agriculture 4.0 um, interpreted and decided by uh, artificial intelligence. And uh, so the uh, level of uh, level of uh, integration and participation of a farmer uh, became uh, smaller and smaller. And uh, I would not uh, talk uh, about ethical issue, uh, but um, actually uh, the transition uh, regarding ethical issue, because uh, there is a, uh, agriculture is one of the biggest um, industry uh, with uh, labor, um, uh, number of people are involved in agriculture and uh, transferring to, uh, from uh, uh, classic agriculture to agriculture 5.0, it is necessary to a uh, huge investment to uh, education and uh, replacing the uh, agro uh, workers uh, to find new job. And uh, all uh, governmentals, uh, on governmentals level have to be ready uh, for these um, revolutionary uh, changes. So, uh, but we are talking about uh, agriculture 4.0 and uh, it needs a huge investment in infrastructure uh, on um, government level. And also it's a uh, need investments to equipment uh, also uh, on governmental or uh, corporate level. And it's still too complicated uh, and require a lot of technical support. Uh, or now grows uh, model like a, a technical as a service model, uh, simply outsourcing. But it's again, um, reduce the um, experience and reduce the knowledge of uh, inside farm and uh, make the dependent uh, from these companies who provide the services. Uh, what is needs and uh, for this uh, evolutional uh, or fast evolutional uh, transition, it is necessary uh, for many farmers uh, low Australian cost uh, because um, due to limited economic capabilities and also a zero investments uh, and low educational requirements. So uh, most farmers um, uh, start um, transformation heavy only uh, if farmers will have uh, only smartphone and access to internet and they already have the uh, uh, interface uh, to optimize uh, some uh, working processes and I will describe uh, how it could be possible and uh, these tools have to be uh, as simple as possible uh, because I'm uh, enthusiast on different agri-tech uh, startups and uh, I'm looking, uh, searching uh, all uh, interesting information around the agri-tech and uh, some solutions uh, which are now presented and uh, exist in the market are uh, quite complicated and uh, for some uh, solutions it needs uh, to have a uh, a level great uh, education uh, in order to understand what uh, they are uh, pretty useful. And actually, uh, for fast start, uh, start, it is necessary to have some features uh, required to simple risk management tool. First of all, it has to be uh, easy to use for everyone. Uh, it has to uh, improve discipline of uh, people who use uh, these tools. 
uh, and these tools have to stimulate this discipline, uh, push uh, uh, to follow the task. A low educational level uh, of users is acceptable. And uh, for some tools, uh, for some uh, areas where uh, farmers uh, not have a uh, university or even school education, uh, and um, there is uh, some tools which uh, give the uh, bottom uh, with icons uh, too easy to flow, the uh, structurate uh, the uh, data flow. So uh, data have to be uh, uh, structured in live flow because uh, when you have a, a big gap between uh, data stream, uh, so uh, it create the possibility to uh, misinterpret uh, this uh, data. Uh, also, data have to be uh, easy to uh, trace uh, by time, place, workers, uh, reverse changes. Uh, without this traceability, uh, again, the main problem uh, that uh, data could be uh, transformed and is uh, presented. Allow and, uh, me to remind Pazibin, you yep. have three minutes to resume the yes, conversation. Yes, I will finish just in a few yeah. minutes. Thank you, uh, thank you. Thank you. And uh, based on this, um, there is a TO uh, app uh, Harrison. So we developed the platform, uh, which is actually uh, could solve the main problem, which uh, I already uh, described. And uh, we already um, has this problem, put this, this platform in Russia, in uh, South Africa, in, in Asia as well. And um, know that uh, data is a game changer of farming and uh, to help uh, make the life of farmers uh, much simple, we have to go through this uh, data collection, data analytics. Uh, as I said, the problem is uh, all uh, data uh, from almost 90%, 95% uh, created from uh, paper and uh, transferred to uh, not everywhere uh, to digital. But uh, we developed the simple tool to data collection. And actually uh, these two are presented in uh, App Store and Desktop and Google Play. And uh, actually in the end of this presentation, there is uh, some contacts uh, numbers and also um, organizers have uh, our contacts in order to make a more deep explanation of this uh, tool. So uh, we uh, control uh, by this tool uh, production, monitor uh, the uh, uh, accurate information synthesis uh, from uh, all information together uh, and uh, create it's uh, make it traceable and uh, we help to decision support uh, in order to uh, transfer and uh, analyze this information this is how it's work there is a different uh, parts and different uh, stakeholders which are involved in this uh, platform and this uh, cross-relation and cross-data streams uh, create the uh, like a special data flow uh, which uh, quite difficult to uh, miss uh, to change and uh, misinterpreted so actually uh, I'm finished uh, on this one and just a second um, and um, so uh, um, the question is what I <laughs> chose before because uh, I go through uh, another presentation. <laughs> Sorry for this. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, this is what I would like to say. And uh, if you have some questions, I will be happy to um, uh, comment uh, to this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zibir. Oh, it's about Tilo is revol uh, quite a revolutionary approach to the monitoring the farming activity. And uh, my key intake here that digital platform can help banks and also investors to improving their understanding and practices of assessing farmers' 
credit risk. So thank you, Pazibin, for your presentation. So you. now I have to uh, move on to the uh, fourth speaker. Uh, the fourth speaker will be uh, Dr. Julia Zurikina. She is currently joining Moscow State Institute of International Relations and Moscow International Institute of Energy Policy and Diplomacy. Interestingly, she is not just an economics, but also a psychologist in international affairs. So this is a very rare combination, right? So maybe you have to start your presentation with explaining why, ma'am. Okay. She has more than six years work experiences in the area of transportation. And she was also an assistant to Minister of Transportation of the Russia Federation and also appointed as official representative of the Ministry of Transport Russia in Brussels. And currently, she works as the Deputy Director of the VEB Russian Federation and also Head of Expert Group of the Arctic Council. So, her long-term experience and expertise in transportation and also blue economy is really related with our today discussion as we know that transportation is one of the Indonesian infrastructure development focus and when you're talking about blue economy Indonesia has huge but maybe unrevealed potential of blue economy since we are one of the biggest archipelago countries in the, in the world right so today she will share a presentation topic of uh, the roles of sovereign institution in environment protection in blue economy and she will cover some arctic project as well and the roles of bank investment in the arctic region so do not miss this precious opportunity to learn from you mr julia it's uh it's time for you ma'am Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the giving me floor. Um, uh, could you help me with the presentation? Uh, okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Could you put the next slide, please? Um, uh, thank you very much that uh, you arrange uh, with discussion. It's very interesting, uh, and uh, many topics uh, are very important for the you know, future development and sustainable development of the uh, economy and global uh, point of view. And uh, in terms of the uh, energy transition, climate regulation, and uh, pandemic uh, 19. Uh, COVID uh, results. Uh, we have uh, in our sovereign institution and uh, funds uh, to um, revise uh, some policies uh, to make um, our project effective and concentrate on the uh, main uh, uh, initiatives uh, which can give uh, the results uh, in uh, new economic conditions. Uh, with uh, pandemic uh, COVID-19 uh, is um, uh, uh, dismissed uh, uh, the energy transition uh, results uh, in our calculations. You see that many uh, factors and um, uh, effects are mixed and uh, it's uh, difficult to recognize uh, what is the main idea of the project and what would be a result. The volatility of uh, the different sectors are going up and um, uh, no clear position how to calculate it and uh, what uh, should investors do uh, in these conditions. Uh, you see, uh, we find uh, some um, uh, very interesting things. For example, that uh, Gazprom uh, equity is uh, now so Tesla equity is uh, like uh, 12 Gazprom. It's uh, a little bit shock uh, for everyone. Uh, and we have uh, to, to do something, uh, how to uh, rearrange uh, our financial policy and uh, the role of the uh, sovereign institutions uh, in these uh, conditions. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like uh, to announce that uh, uh, during the year, we are um, restoring uh, the system of uh, Russian sovereign institutions. Uh, WBRF, uh, uh, now it's 
It's called in WebRF. Uh, firstly, it was Nishikanom Bank. Uh, I think that you know uh, his name. He's coming as uh, the uh, main uh, institute of development of the Russian Federation. And of the other institutions are going um, inside uh, the WebRF. And um, one of um, them uh, is outside, which devote to the Arctic development. And you see it's uh, in the picture that for Arctic, uh, we've got uh, already five institutions before. Now we have uh, big uh, pyramids, uh, which concentrated uh, on the uh, projects uh, with uh, the effects. Uh, the main role in the Arctic uh, today is uh, playing the Ministry of the uh, Far East Development and Arctic of the Russian Federation. And we've got um, a special institute of development there, which uh, is connected uh, directly with WPRF. In WPRF, uh, we have um, a special block, which called uh, Far East and Arctic. And uh, so uh, we have funding uh, and we have uh, the institution which um, uh, actually uh, arranged a system of uh, financing and um, uh, we are preparing some instruments of support. What like um, I'd like to add um, here. Um, now we have uh, received um, a mandate uh, to be um, a methodological, methodological, the methodological center for the green and sustainable finance. Uh, so we prepared uh, our, the project of our um, uh, Russian national taxonomy, uh, the main rules uh, of the verification. Uh, and uh, we are ready uh, to start this project uh, in Russia. Um, and it is uh, very important, I think, um, uh, to uh, develop uh, a big uh, project uh, and um, a macro regional projects uh, in these conditions. Um, so uh, when we prepared uh, uh, the project of the taxonomy, we identified that climate regulation uh, may be the main factor uh, for the profitability and uh, future perspectives uh, of the project. Um, that's why uh, we um, uh, identified too that um, uh, not all the projects uh, in the uh, green segment or sustainable segment is uh, uh, more effect is effective uh, in uh, the situation of climate regulation. Um, and um, the, for example, forestry is a very nice segment uh, and very prospective, but uh, it takes a uh, uh, long uh, period, for example, 10 years to start this project. And only after this 10 years period, we can uh, calculate uh, some um, uh, green uh, uh, green um, uh, elements uh, to sell or to uh, put inside the project. Um, what we'd like uh, to uh, to stress that um, could uh, you put the next slide? Uh, that the blue economy is more prospective uh, for this type of uh, projects. Uh, we um, uh, focused uh, on the energy pro uh, projects, for example, uh, green uh, uh, electricity production. Uh, there are many uh, absolutely new uh, ideas for this. Uh, for example, it's uh, wave uh, electricity production, which uh, not uh, widely used uh, in the world, but uh, it's uh, started uh, very quickly. Um, and um, uh, production uh, in connection with uh, green electricity, um, of course, uh, green hydrogen. Uh, it's a good uh, uh, prospective uh, branch for the uh, relation and uh, uh, our cooperation. So we can uh, discuss it and uh, we have some project uh, uh, very concrete, for example, in uh, uh, Parumashir in Sakhalin region, uh, you know, it, uh, it's far east. Um, it's possible to product hydrogen uh, and export it uh, to Japan, uh, 
uh, or somewhere else, uh, and we are ready to do it. We investigate the possibility in practical way how how to, how to do it. Um, so, uh, could you put the next slide? Uh, blue economy uh, today is uh, even more uh, prospective uh, than uh, green uh, because uh, water is became um, uh, uh, more prospective than uh, oil and gas. Uh, so uh, when we concentrated of the economy of the uh, ocean, uh, we can um, put in one uh, um, so. Uh, in one project, uh, even climate regulation, um, perspectives of the uh, export, and uh, um, new relations uh, with um, uh, different countries. Could you put the next slide? Uh, what we can uh, say about Arctic? Um, of course, Arctic is a little bit far from the Indonesia, <laughs> I know it, but uh, many non-Arctic countries are interested uh, uh, in about the situation uh, in this macro region because uh, it's uh, uh, a real fridge for the, uh, all the world. And uh, the effectiveness of uh, the project which we uh, have uh, in the Arctic, especially uh, climate uh, regulation projects uh, included in this um, uh, field, uh, it uh, gives a possibility for the different countries uh, to um, take part in these um, projects and receive uh, the benefits uh, even in global um, level. Uh, what we'd like to do, uh, we are trying uh, to uh, create uh, today a new uh, rules. Uh, Russia is uh, um, of investments. Russia from the May of uh, 2021 uh, became uh, head of the Arctic Council for the two years. So it's a, a good possibility to have uh, this uh, discussion panel uh, and um, to create new institutions. For example, uh, we haven't got uh, now uh, any uh, Institute of Development for the Arctic. We've got many for different uh, for the different regions, but for Arctic, no. Uh, so we discuss in it as the uh, framework of the Arctic Council, uh, and we hope that uh, we give uh, the chance for everyone who'd like to to do it uh, to take part. Could you the next slide? Uh, and next, and next. So uh, we have um, uh, good perspectives for the uh, aquacultures and the fishery in, in the regions, especially that uh, temperature, unfortunately, is going up and uh, it's a new ability uh, to develop uh, uh, fishery uh, floating and uh, the farms uh, of aquacultures. Could you put the next slide? Um, what uh, type of projects we can identify? Uh, water resources uh, of drinking water, it's very important. Uh, and energy islands and um, uh, offshore platforms, uh, which we are making uh, at the basis of the ports. The next slide, please. Um, here you can see very exotic uh, food. Uh, French uh, companies like to use uh, and have good uh, uh, experience uh, how to transport uh, uh, iceberg uh, to the um, European countries. Uh, there is a technology how to use uh, with uh, resource of uh, drinking water uh, to the um, in, uh, in some regions, you know that uh, there is a deficit of uh, drinking water, for example, in France. And uh, this is the first uh, type of projects which uh, we are uh, supported. Uh, please, the next slide. 
Uh, uh, this is um, a little bit new. Uh, energy islands, which are creating uh, in the uh, Northern Sea, in Darkmar Dan Denmark, uh, in Norway, and uh, we use this practi practice too in Russia, not only the North, but uh, in the uh, Caspian Sea, uh, in uh, Black Sea. But the most uh, uh, prospective is for the uh, Northern Sea and uh, for the uh, Caspian Sea. Uh, the idea to have a complex uh, uh, decision uh, for the uh, absolutely green, and uh, it's important uh, for the uh, enterprises who are situated uh, at the region because uh, you know the um, export uh, climate regulation of the European Union. Um, uh, stimulated us uh, to, to uh, go to this uh, type of projects. Uh, the next slide, please. Um, this is the uh, idea uh, to make a complex uh, multi-purpose uh, offshore platform. Uh, it's uh, example uh, the port uh, Lina, harbor uh, Lina Hamari. It's uh, situated uh, in Murmansk region uh, near the, uh, Norway, and uh, it's um, uh, a good uh, uh, geographical situation, uh, good uh, ge geographical uh, factors uh, which influenced on this port. It's um, um, deep water and um, uh, no uh, stress uh, um, ice conditions. So it's a, a good start uh, for the uh, North uh, Road, uh, which are discussing uh, in the Arctic uh, region. Um, the next slide, please. Uh, and next one. Uh, what uh, we have is an opportunities of the uh, investment uh, for the um, blue economy. Uh, for Russia, it's a, a new experience because, as you know, that uh, Moscow is the center of the science uh, situated really far from the um, sea. Uh, so uh, it was uh, a, a gap uh, between uh, scientific researchers uh, and uh, a practical base. Uh, we are not concentrated uh, on the, uh, this type of ta the technolo technologies. So today uh, we uh, identify um, many uh, branches uh, like uh, um, electricity and energy in Iceland, like uh, um, water and icebergs and um, aquaculture and uh, fishing. Uh, so we are going fast and um, uh, we see that uh, more than, um, uh, let's say, uh, 100 uh, billion uh, dollars uh, um, potential uh, only for the hydrogen export uh, from this, uh, yeah, potential for the hydrogen export. Um, for the uh, blue economy at the north and far east of the Russian Federation, it's uh, far east uh, market and uh, possible hubs for the hydrogen uh, is uh, situated uh, near the <coughs> um, um, near the new markets uh, which are using this uh, type of energy. We have started uh, communication uh, with uh, Japanese uh, companies like Mitsui, for example. They have good, good technologies uh, like tankers, for example, to transport uh, hydrogen. Uh, so we I invited you to prolong this discussion and uh, I think it would be a really prospective for the uh, institutions and give us uh, a new chance uh, to develop uh, our collaboration and uh, cooperation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Uh, Julia. So, uh, 
economy is quite new for most of the audience that are attending the seminar here, but this is a very quite uh, interesting quote from you that what are more prospective than oil and gas. So it's quite new, right? And the new concept is quite new, but it's very interesting regarding that the uh, population in, in, in the world is getting uh, increasing and also uh, clean drinking water will be more uh, crucial for the next future. Thank you, Mrs. Julia. So um, last but not least, we come up to our last uh, speaker, but I think this is uh, most audience also waiting for the, his presentation. Our last speaker is Mr. Doni Arsal, CFA, CFO and also risk director of Jasamarga. Previously, he was managing director of Mandiri Securitas, a subsidiary of Bank Mandiri, and has 20 years working experience in capital market, banking and advisory transactions. And he also successfully launched many securitization and bond projects such as uh, Commodore Bond, Islamic Bond, Suku, and also mutual funds to support new toll road developments. So he also graduated from the University of Indonesia. And today he will share with us his experience, especially where uh, in utilization of uh, several uh, sovereign wealth fund for infrastructure financing. And he will also cover some tips to build a funding strategy through capital market, bank, or of course, uh, sovereign wealth fund. So I see many bankers and also market players are attending the webinar here. So this is the perfect uh, the perfect time for you to get inside behind the scene of the toll road financing from the owner perspective. So it's an honor to have you here, Pak Doni. Thank you very much. Thank you. Both. And uh, okay, without further ado, the time is yours, Pak. Well, thank minutes. you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Pak Ayu. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, audience, and uh, distinguished speaker. First of all, thanks for allowing me to become one of the speaker. Uh, I want to start with the uh, introduction with Jasa Marga, just to answer what Adida mentioned uh, in the, the presentation before. Uh, so uh, Jasa Marga was established in 1978. It's already 43 years. At the time, until 2004, Jasa Marga became as a regulator and investor as well. So, so there were to function as a regulator and uh, operator. But since uh, uh, there was a new regulation law that divided uh, the Samarga to become only as investor starting from 2004 and uh, 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 giving uh, the authority role to the government under what's so called uh, BPGT uh, uh, right now. And then uh, the other milestone is a uh, 2007 when the Samarga did uh, the IPO. Uh, I helped the Samarga at the time to uh, to do the IPO. And 2016, until 2016, the Samarga operate uh, 593 kilometers. And what happened in 2019? We operate uh, 1,162 kilometers. So we double up the business only in three years. So previously we only built around 16 kilometers per year. Uh, in three years, we built around 190 kilometers per year. So there are a lot of capex that we spend for only th three years. And as we show in this slide, uh, uh, when we we uh, 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 split the function in 2004, we were awarded 13 co uh, concession, what so called the 13 uh, major total con uh, concession, included um, JOR, uh, Jakarta Cikampek, Jagarawi, also inner circle uh, of Jakarta. Uh, that with the length of the toll road that being operated is 512. So we are facing to build uh, at a time only uh, 18 concession that we were awarded uh, at 2000, before 2017. So number one until 18, 
uh, all, all of those uh, concessions were awarded uh, to us uh, before 2017 and uh, uh, the last three uh, were, awarded, uh, were awarded at 2017 at, at, at the end of 2017 and uh, number 21 Jakarta, Jakarta Bawen we were awarded uh, last year uh, so we are, we, are, we are facing how to finance more than 150 trillion at a time while we cannot rely on our balance sheet and also uh, the liquidity. Uh, we build uh, 20 times double our uh, ordinary capacity based on the previous year. Uh, and the good news is the 18 concession, all the 18 concession, number one until 18 has been finish and being operated uh, so far so this is a good news when we pass uh, when we operated uh, the new toll road means that uh, we already uh, passed through the two biggest issue on the toll road um, um, uh, construction which is uh, number one is the land clearance issue uh, so many toll road um, has been stuck for many years, like uh, Surabaya Mojokerto uh, has been stuck for the last 20 years and, uh, until we start uh, construction and operated that station at the end of 2017. So in this slide, I want to show you the the stages of the building a new toll road that we start in the land acquisition because all of the concession is under the uh, national strategic project, uh, government um, uh, paid the land clearance, and that's uh, it takes around one to two years to make the land clearance, and after that we start the construction, and we are in the phase, in the stage of the negative cash flow period on the level of subsidiary. So, uh, to add my uh, my explanation before. The 13 all concession is uh, are in our balance sheet. We call it branches, but under new regulation uh, 2004, we have to establish one subsidiary for one new toll concession. The revenue will uh, move up um, uh, according to the development of the surrounding area of the toll road, uh, while the obligation we have to pay at 100%. So the revenue still need to ramp up until five to seven years. Um, what so or what we call it the negative cash flow period. So so far, the thirteen concession support all the liability or um, um, commitment uh, to the subsidiary level. And after that period, uh, we are facing what so called the major toro that. Uh, um, that it's gonna be uh, the second harvest time for Jasa Marga, but we have to wait until the time comes. We have to go through with the negative cash flow period. Now, on the bottom um, explanation on, on this slide, uh, we already um, conducted several type of the in, uh, of, of financing uh, uh, to each of this uh, stage. And, and we, we want to continue um, uh, several initiatives in the future uh, in order us to make sure that all the financing will match uh, the needs of the project actually. This is several, including equity and also uh, the debt instrument. So, uh, the next slide. Uh, this is the capex on the project level, 30% should come from the equity and 70 percent uh, from the bank so we don't have um, luxury or flexibility in financing at the beginning of the toll road we only rely on uh, the bank financing uh, on the first time and then after uh, the toll road uh, being operated we uh, flipping uh, the financing to the capital market uh, we did several for the project level uh, that's the uh, strategy uh, on the financing. On the equity, because uh, we need to support in terms of the equity, we also invite uh, several uh, investors through the mutual fund 
to participate in the certain period of the time. And we also divested uh, one or two uh, uh, concession uh, stake uh, to our partner in order for us to um, support the equity needs to the new project. The next one. Uh, this is the condition until right now. Yeah, most of the financing still in the bank, uh, 95%. And Tenar uh, still on, on the mid yeah, term uh, and on the equity side uh, because of most of the uh, project uh, already finished. Uh, most of the equity already in the brownfield um, uh, project already. Uh, and then next one. Uh, this is the role uh, um, INA could participate on the toll road business uh, because uh, most of the toll road uh, that we have uh, are already, already being operated so far. So we already passed through the biggest um, uh, issue, the land clearance and the uh, escalation of project costs and also the delay of the project. So we only face the traffic uh, risk and the tariff. Tariff, uh, we are protected by the law that there is a guarantee to increase the tariff every two years. And, and on, the, on the traffic issue, so we believe that we are still uh, as a development country. So. Uh, um, there is a potential uh, traffic to, to grow faster in the future. So, uh, because our uh, balance sheet is already heavy um, since we built so many toll road or double up the business uh, only in three years. So we need to unload some portion of our investment in order to us to rebalance the capital structure and also to support uh, the future development of the toll road. So what we want, what I want to emphasize is the total project that uh, we have is more than 150 trillion uh, in terms of equity and debt. Uh, so uh, on the brownfield uh, project, uh, there are a lot of opportunity uh, for us to cooperate with INA to, uh, uh, to in the form of the asset recycling of Jasa Marga. In the future, we change our strategy uh, from the massive capex to become the uh, rebalancing the financial stability and sustainable growth. That's why we need to uh, to recycle some of the asset uh, to to become uh, to to be able for us to make a, a solid. Uh, financial uh, um, condition uh, to support uh, the government uh, program in the future. I think that's all, Bu Ayu, for my presentation. Thank you very much, Pak Doni. So, uh, so thank you very much for explaining us the lifetime of toll road development. So we have a very variety of financing strategy there. Okay. I think now we have uh, entering the uh, Q&A question now, thank you. So um, before that we uh, entering the question, there are so many questions coming and lots of questions came uh, for Mr. Rida, but unfortunately that Mr. Rida has another meeting uh, uh, that cannot be uh, left, so that's why all the questions to Mr. Rida will be delivered by LPPI to uh, INA and we'll respond back to you immediately. And all the presentation slide along also with the consolidation of this Q&A session will be also delivered to all participants. And Mr. Rida, uh, uh, Mr. Rida send you a big apologies for that. So I think I have to start with the uh, next question from Mr. Dendi Ardian Syah. Kurniawan he is from the Indonesian uh, Fertilizer Indonesia, Pupuk Indonesia, and he has a question for Mr. Zibin. And his question is, how effective is a sovereign wealth fund to finance the agriculture project because the slow return of this kind of project? Mr. Zibin, your answer? Yes, thank you. Um... <laughs> 
actually, uh, <clears throat> we have uh, uh, could give uh, to investor because actually um, the problem was uh, that um, uh, investor would like to uh, protect uh, the investment as much as possible, uh, but uh, agriculture is uh, very uh, very. Uh, uh, risky investments, and uh, in this case, uh, it has to be a tool of which could uh, give full transparency uh, to investor. And uh, in other uh, words, if uh, investors uh, see only uh, figures uh, quarterly or based on uh, season uh, early. Uh, on um, more than a uh, 12 month cycle, uh, it's like, uh, as I said, a uh, black box. Uh, you put money uh, and you don't know what happens uh, with this money. And um, uh, this is actually, of course, uh, could be uh, the right solution uh, because, uh, as Mr. Nazem said, uh, this is a uh, long term uh, perspective. And uh, for sovereign fund and uh, investment to uh, agriculture is also long-term perspective. And uh, if to create the mechanism uh, where uh, investors and uh, agricultural producers will talk on the same language, uh, it would be uh, for sure a very uh, productive um, uh, collaboration. Hopefully, I'm answering the question. Thank you, Mr. Zibin. Hopefully that answer also Dendi. Okay, I will come to the next question came from Bapak Oke and his question is addressed to Mrs. Julia. And his question is, uh, let me see, how to finance the blue economy? Do you think, uh, do you take the fund from the sovereign wealth fund or the government that funded? Mr. Julia, your answer? Ah, yes, it's a really good uh, question and I can answer it. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't got a uh, special fund yet, but uh, we are working uh, on uh, the taxonomy. Uh, so we included uh, blue economy to the um, uh, national uh, taxonomy for the sustainable development. And uh, today we can use uh, uh, all instrument uh, of the support, uh, governmental support, uh, to um, finance uh, with uh, type of uh, projects. Uh, it's uh, financial support and of course uh, our instruments like uh, uh, Russian fabric of uh, finance, we as uh, Institute of the Development uh, taking risk and um, uh, in this uh, situation banks which are uh, financing uh, the project uh, can give uh, the better uh, uh, condition for the finance. So, in in one two words, uh, in general. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Mrs. Julia, for answering. I hope that it does uh, answer your question. But okay, so let me go to uh, the next question. Uh, and this question came from uh, Pak Imam and Pak Freddy Arifin. And this question, uh, I want to combine it because it's addressed to uh, Pak Doni. Pak Imam say, uh, uh, asked Pak Doni, how do you think the effectiveness of sovereign wealth fund to finance the infrastructure project? And then I will combine it with Pak Freddy question. And what is the obstacle for financing the development of toll road? Pak Doni, could you yeah. answer that question? Yeah. Uh, I think uh, this a new opportunity for us actually um, uh, to uh, work together with uh, INA uh, regarding uh, the, the investment uh, because they have uh, they, they are back up with the fund uh, several investors they also uh, uh, interested on the tow road right they have the capacity um, uh, to uh, to buy the tow road um, uh, and also uh, because of the big fund and the well experienced uh, key person at the toll road, uh, I think it's going to be the good uh, prospect for us actually. And 
and uh, you know that most of our, our toll road uh, are located in uh, Greater Jakarta and uh, Transawa area that have the good prospect. So uh, it's gonna be a good opportunity as well for Ina and the fund to participate on the uh, divestment of the toll road from the Samarga. That's that's for the effectiveness, right? So we have uh, we could close the deal in the uh, next uh, uh, feature, uh, next uh, couple months. I mean, then. and uh, uh, the second question regarding the obstacle is number one to convince the lender to finance the toll road and not um, perceive the toll road is a very uh, risky project. Yeah. So what we proved that where they built 18 concession only in three in, in three years, that uh, all of them have a good uh, a prospect. How to convince the, uh, that the project could be um, uh, managed uh, in terms of the risk uh, and also um, has a, a good prospect to pay all the uh, obligation to the lenders. So. At the beginning, when I joined the Samarga, only several banks that could participate. Now it's already 39 banks that uh, participated on the all, all the total that uh, we have. Yeah. That's the, the answer for you. Thank you, Padoni. And banks also have a very uh, tight risk management, right? So when you said that 39 banks joining the total, so it's also maybe answer the question that about the obstacle. Yes, there's an obstacle, but it, the risk can be managed, right? So uh, I think we have a, a chance for the last question. Last question for uh, Mr. Nazim. Uh, Mr. Nazim, are you still there? Yes, yes, I'm here. Okay, okay. Mr. Nazim, there's one last question from uh, Ibu. I guess it is Ibu. Ibu Evi Nefiadi asked you about the LRT. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm forget what's the abbreviation of LRT. It's a, uh, 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 I forget about it. <laughs> Apologize for that. Basically, LRT projects are not financially visible. It's the uh, uh, train, uh, slow train inside the city. And then without huge government support or other large government support contribution, right now there are only five big LRT projects to be implemented in Indonesia. So the question is, how can we use the Sovereign Wealth Fund for funding this uh, uh, public project? And what is the pro and cons for adopting this uh, 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 mainly combination, mainly versus the utilization of source loan from multilateral, uh, multi multilateral uh, development banks such as uh, World Bank or ADB? Can you uh, elaborate that, Mr. Nazib? Yes, yes, we'll, um, I'll try to touch on the subject. So certain projects uh, that have long-term uh, economic and uh, environmental benefits to the nation uh, have to be looked at in a holistic perspective. And therefore, some type of a government uh, subsidy in terms of incentives, in terms of tax breaks, some type of a package has to be introduced to uh, investors. Now, my simple recommendation would be that to invite the private sector uh, public funds, uh, i.e. funds that invest in infrastructure alongside uh, sovereign wealth funds. Because what happens in this game, it's uh, comfort in numbers. It's like you want to throw a party. And if you hear that so-and-so are coming to the party, you say, you know what? I also want to go to the party. Uh, but this has to be done again. Once uh, the stakeholders appreciate the holistic benefit of such uh, public transportation uh, systems in the long term, they have to put the appropriate package. And I'm not, I'm not saying to bend backwards in terms of incentives, but you put enough incentives to invite and most sovereign wealth funds, uh, I will say this with eyes semi closed, when they see the company of other private funds that specialize in this asset class, they would be far more receptive. 
So that's how I would look at it. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Nazim, for that answering that question. Okay, uh, finally, we are entering the final session of this webinar. It's almost more than two hours, two hours, two hours and 30 minutes, I guess. Okay, so I will invite all the speakers to give a short closing remarks, maybe about two or three minutes. And kindly, please give the key takeaway that you think might be valuable for the audience. So I will start with our guests, uh, first Mr. Nazim, and then Mrs. Yulia, and then followed by uh, Mr. Zivi. And I think over to you, Mr. Nazim, your closing remark. Thank you very much. Uh, a great pleasure this morning to be among distinguished guests. This is a very special uh, moment in the history of your great nation. As we talked earlier, a child is born, a very important child. Um, I am personally very positive on Indonesia and, and given the wealth of assets uh, that it uh, offers. I think uh, we're entering a global environment that is going to be supportive uh, to the country. The ability of the different stakeholders working together and presenting a very attractive uh, environment for foreign capital to come in uh, is going to be the decisive factor. Thank you very much for the opportunity and wish all the success uh, for Indonesia. Thank you, Mr. Nazim. Now, uh, Mrs. Julia, could you uh, use your have a short closing remark, please? Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for for the invitation to take part in this uh, discussion. It's uh, a really a great pleasure for me uh, to present uh, our ideas, uh, maybe even about Arctic, uh, that's a little bit far from the Indonesia, but I think it's maybe a perspective uh, for everyone uh to uh, develop this um, uh, climatic uh, projects and um, uh, i think uh, the main uh, impact uh, to this discussion will be that uh, we need to find uh, some uh, way and mechanism uh, how to develop this type of projects uh, from the position uh, not uh, only profitability marginality but uh, with the environmental impact uh, inside uh, it's not easy we have uh, standard um, investment uh, policies uh, so now we are finding the way uh, and uh, would be ready if uh, everyone will support us uh, on this way thank you thank you mary very much mrs julia and now uh, mrs zibins your turn now uh, thank you very much uh, to invite me um, for this uh, conversation and uh, it's very pleasure to talk with you and uh, I would like to uh, say um, good luck and uh, develop um, agriculture in Indonesia because uh, 63, uh, 65 million farmers uh, are working daily uh, in Indonesia and it's a huge amount and um, everywhere uh, farmers uh, uh, saying that the struggling uh, from uh, a lack of uh, investment in their activities and um, uh, for Sullivan Wells Fund, I hope they uh, could find the way uh, to uh, speak on the same language uh, each together in order to uh, develop uh, the agriculture and uh, agriculture could grow uh, steadily and uh, show perfect results uh, because it's a uh, uh, sovereign um, issue uh, to national security, first of all. Uh, and uh, thank you and good luck. Thank you, Mr. Zibin. And finally, we will invite Mr. Doni to, to conclude your closing remark. Thank Adoni? you. Yeah, I think the infrastructure sector is, uh, still has uh, interesting um, um, things to be invested for the investor, including in uh, uh, with uh, uh, some backup for all the investor uh, that we prove that we could build uh, so many toll road around 600 kilometers for the last three years and still we could uh, manage the prospect, uh, the, manage the risk and uh, uh, 
be optimistic that infrastructure still has a good potential um, uh, uh, growth and opportunity in the future. And the presence of INA help us to expedite the development of the new tower in the future. Thank you, Bayu. Thank you, Pak Doni. Wish you luck Pak, with your old toll road. We will waiting for your uh, progress. So, so now I invite everybody here. We give uh, our all remarkable speakers with big virtual applause. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone. So. We appreciated all the speakers and also the enthusiasm of the audience. Uh, it was really an honor for me to hosting you today. So hopefully everybody got the best interest and the LPPI will send you all the material and also the QNA uh, consolidation paper. And thank you and we will see you on next time. And allow me to give the mic back to MC. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Back Wa to you, Mas Yogi. Great. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Our massive appreciation uh, to all speakers and moderator for our beloved audience's information. At the moment, LBPI is conducting SESPI Bank uh, Sekolah Staff dan Pimpinan Bank, at 74. So, SESPI Bank is the top authority. Also, Mr. Nazim Fawaz Al Qudsi, former CEO of Invest AD and former Chief Investment Officer of National Bank of Abu Dhabi. Mr. Mikhail Zibin, CEO of Perfectum Capital. Professor Julia Chwarikina. Deputy Director of VEB, Bapak Doni Arsal, Director of Finance and Risk Management Jasa Marga, and for our remarkable moderator, Ibu Ayu Sari Wulandari, alumna of SESPI Bank, batch 52, and also SVP Data Management and Analytics of BNI. And again, we would like to extend our thanks to Jasa Marga and Media partner Majalah Stabilitas for the support. For all those we mentioned, thank you very much indeed for participating in this seminar. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for spending time with us today. I hope you found out today's seminar informative and insightful. Apologies if we couldn't cover all of the questions asked due to the limited time allotment. E-certificate is provided at the link written on the screen and chat column right there. And download link for the slide decks are available at our website. Just easily download at lppi.org.id. We can inform you as well that we had 156 audiences in Google Meet Room and 421 audiences on YouTube streaming, which in uh, in total we reach 577 audiences on board. Should you need any infos regarding schedule, upcoming events, trainings or programs, please kindly visit our website at lppi.org.id or follow our Instagram and YouTube channel at lppi underscore it. Our next workshop will be on Tuesday, June 15, with the topic of Keuangan Berkelanjutan Dalam Pemulihan Ekonomi Nasional means Sustainable Finance in National Economic Recovery. So stay tuned, guys. Again, thank you very much indeed for joining us today, and we will see you next time. Stay safe, stay healthy. Bye-bye.